Amen. Any Jesus lovers here? Amen. All right, if you guys can uh, take seats, that'd be great. I hate to break up fellowship. Good to see you, James. How are you guys? Good, Praise the Lord, man. All right. Oh, man. All right, let's uh, pray and seek the Lord. Father God, we come into your presence with praise and with thanksgiving, and we just give you glory and honor. And we just thank you, Father, that we can come together in the middle of the week and just get filled with your word and keep our minds stayed on you, Lord, and, and just uh, rely on you and seek your face and grow as we just press on to know you and love you and, and grow in you. And we just pray, Father, that you'd fill us with your word, that you'd accomplish your purposes in us, Father, that we'd be totally sold out for Jesus, Father, that we'd be filled with your, your fire, Lord, that the fire of the Spirit, Lord, that would just fill us overflowing. Pray you bless our children's church today, uh, nursery young people, Father. We pray you bless our service this evening here. We pray you strengthen and bless all the other potentially millions of people who may be meeting right now in the midweek services, uh, that Christ would be first, Father, that you would be glorified, Father, and that if you've been jettisoned from the churches, Father, we pray that they'd hear your knock, they'd open and allow you to reign over your own church. We pray certainly that you'd reign here over our hearts and our fellowship. Father, we thank you that this is your son's church, your church, and we pray that we glorify you by speaking your word and truth and living for your glory. In your son's name we pray. Amen. All right. Praise God. How is everybody? Good to see you guys. Okay. Thanks, Lenny. Straighten me out up here. Thing kind of gets tweaked sometimes. Thank God for the sound folks back there. I say guys, but Haley's back there too, so sound folks. Uh, you guys are awesome. Now, I want to encourage you guys to, uh, we've been doing a series on discipleship, and I'm not going to do every Wednesday, although we'll have plenty of Wednesdays on discipleship, and we'll return, return to it again and again, but uh, it won't be every Wednesday, because I want to break it up a little bit, that way every Wednesday it's not a discipleship message, although every message is really a discipleship message, isn't it? Because what does it mean to be a disciple? It means to be a what? A learner, a learner of our Lord, and every message is about growing in our knowledge of who He is, Amen. But I just want to do a message uh, tonight on a doctrine that I think has just really uh, been a threat in the church. I personally believe it is the most dangerous uh, false doctrine in the church. And we could talk about what would be the most dangerous false doctrines in the church. There are plenty of them. But I personally think that the doctrine of once saved, always saved, that once you just come to Jesus, you can fall away and do whatever you want and you'll be saved in the end is the biggest lie in the church. I think it's the most destructive lie in the church. So, anyway, let me see if I can get this thing right. I'm going to tweak it down extra low, and hopefully when it pops up, it'll be normal. Uh, but anyway, uh, now there's different versions of this lie. Uh, there's the idea that, you know, well, if you do get saved, you turn to Jesus, you know, you just will never fall away. You might fall into, hey, as long as it's getting picked up, guys, I don't care what it looks like. Can you, is, it, is it good connection? Okay, we're all good. So, hey, I'm letting you guys know right now, there's a few versions, the idea that once you're saved, you're always saved because you will automatically persevere to the end because God's given you a special gift of grace. He's been partial and he's chosen you uh, and another, a small group of other people, the few that went to the narrow gate and he's given you the gift of perseverance with, and with irresistible grace, he's gonna make sure you persevere to the end. Even if you fall away into all kinds of wickedness, he'll bring you back in the end and so forth and you'll still be saved. That's a popular doctrine known as Perseverance of the Saints, uh, taught by Calvinists. Uh, the other version of that is called Once Saved, Always Saved, the idea that you, you're saved, but you can totally fall away. You won't necessarily persevere in the faith. You can fall away. You can become a Satanist and open up a whorehouse and, and rip off a bunch of people, and uh, you'll just lose some rewards, maybe lose your crown or something, but you'll still be saved in the end. That's a very popular doctrine taught throughout a lot of the Bible Belt uh, and so forth. And it's called, not, they, don't, they emphasize the once saved, always saved, or the eternal security aspect. A lot of Calvinists don't like to use the term once saved, always saved, because they believe in what they call perseverance of the saints. A true saint will persevere to the end. So many Calvinists will speak as strongly sometimes as I do against the idea that you could fall away and still be saved. Arthur Pink was a very strong Calvinist, and he wrote a book called Once Saved, Always Saved, which I have in my library, and I've read, and he, he sounds like me to a degree. Although he's still once saved, always saved, in the sense that he believes you will persevere. And then he gives, he's really frustrated through the book because his Calvinistic brethren are not preaching the warnings about falling away, even though he believes that they're just bluffs. 
but they're bluffs that are intended to get the Calvinists to persevere. But since the bluffs aren't being preached, how will they persevere? But then again, they have to persevere. So he's in a quandary. He really, it's kind of, it would be comical if I didn't, you didn't feel for the guy through, the, through it as he's frustrated that the warnings were, are being passed over by the Calvinist and the non-Calvinist proponents who once saved, always saved. You simply believe in a, a bastardization of the fifth point, perseverance of the saints. They twist it into preservation of the sinner. God will preserve you no matter what, even if you fall away. So as we deal with this doctrine, the name of this message is called Five Death Blows to OSAS, or to Once Saved, Always Saved. And I want to look at five specific passages. Uh, I'm going to be looking at more than five different scriptures, but five main passages that I think will be quite revealing. And I want you to, to focus on the word again. The word again that will show up in all the five passages I want to look at that I think are quite instructive on this issue. Now, it's also quite instructive if you like to study historical theology, uh, especially if you like to study early church history, you'll notice in the early church fathers for the first few centuries of church history, there was no such thing as once saved, always saved, or the inevitable perseverance of the saints. It wasn't taught. Uh, the early church fathers, in fact, it's often conceded by Calvinistic leaders that the early church fathers were not once saved, always saved. They didn't believe in that you would automatically persevere and what have you. In fact, what's interesting about the early church is they actually warned against it because the only ones that were known for teaching that once you're saved, you're always saved no matter what were the Gnostics. The Gnostics had a high view of predeterminism. The Gnostics rejected a lot of the Old Testament. Many, many of them did. They believed that the creator of the universe, many of them, was Yahweh, but that he was an evil God and he created matter, which is evil because he's an evil God. And he made matter to trap us in these bodies. And many of the Gnostics, like the Valentinians and others, taught the idea that Sophia was really the one who channeled the serpent and told Eve if she broke Yahweh's laws, she could be set free and release her inner divinity and so forth and on and on. Gnosticism, basically Satanism, where God gets turned to the devil and Satan's turned into God. But the Gnostics had a strong view of predeterminism. In fact, the early church fathers would argue against their view, the Gnostic view of predestination. It's the Gnostics in the first few centuries that took Romans 9 and believed it meant that you had no choice in your salvation. In fact, Origen, one of the early church fathers, uh, actually has a lot of words to say about the Gnostics teaching and combating their view of Romans chapter 9. But they weren't considered Christians against heresies. One of the most awesome books in the second century written by the top uh, church apologist Irenaeus was all about the, against the Gnostics. And Irenaeus warned that they taught that you, once you're saved, you could, you, you're saved no matter what. Origen said, one of the church fathers, he said the Gnostics believe that pe some people are lost in such a way that they can't be saved. That's what Calvinists teach today because they're not chosen. And that other people are saved in such a way that they can't be lost. Sound familiar? Now it's not until you get to the 4th and 5th century when you get to Augustine that you first start seeing that people are unconditionally predestined without a genuine choice or predestined to salvation by beginning, being given a gift where they'll un, infallibly be saved in the end. And he was a Manichaean Gnostic for almost 10 years. In fact, uh, uh, Augustine historians point out that when he was battling Pelagius, he reverted back to a lot of his Gnostic ideas, a lot of his Gnostic teachings. And he was a Roman Catholic theologian, the primary Roman Catholic theologian, the, the father of, the, of theology in the Roman Catholic Church. He's considered a saint in the Roman Catholic Church. But, uh, and he said this, he wrote this. But now to the saints predestined to the kingdom of God by God's grace, he said, perseverance itself is bestowed. So they're given the gift of perseverance so they won't fall away. So that by means of this gift, they cannot help persevering. In other words, they're going to automatically persevere. That's what Augustine taught. By the way, it's kind of interesting though, that was rejected by the Roman Catholic Church even. And even Augustine didn't say that of all professing Christians. He didn't say that of all regenerate believers. He believed there were truly born again believers that would fall away and lose their salvation still. Because he was keeping with the warnings in the scripture and the teaching of the early church fathers in that light. He just added the teaching that there were certain people that were given the gift of perseverance. It wasn't until the 1500s, fast forward 1500 years after Jesus, 
And I'm kind of, if I don't move as well as normal, I got this like lower backache going on right now. Yesterday was really hard. My wife's like, are you okay? I'm barely walking, you know. And it was moving up my back, you know. Anyway, it's because I switched pillows or something. But anyway, I'm good. Uh, the outward man decays, but the inward man is renewed day by day. Amen. So it's interesting that John Calvin, in the 1500s, called Augustine father over and over in his institutes at the age of 27. And when he wrote the institutes, he later wrote a preface that it was, uh, it was like a work from God, you know. And it was a key to understanding the scriptures, an indispensable re- re- prerequisite to understand scripture. Woo, what is that? That's like the language of Mary Baker Eddy and keys to the scripture, you know. And there was, a, there was a huge vacuum where people wanted truth. They were leaving the Catholic Church in spades. And Lutheranism was growing. And, you know, had, and Calvin said, he's got it, you know. And Calvin called even Augustine Holy Father. And Calvin said he preferred Calvin to, or Augustine to the early church fathers. And he should have just jettisoned Augustine and just stayed with the scripture, guys. Then he wouldn't have got the Gnostic twist. Because Calvinism is, neo, is, is you know, uh, a form of Gnosticism in certain elements, okay? It's semi-Gnosticism. And uh, because these teachings were derived and not found in church, early church history. And the scriptures that are used to teach Calvinism contradict a whole lot of other scriptures because they, and if, if, if your scriptures that you're using contradict a whole bunch of other scriptures, something wrong with your interpretation, amen? So if you're saying God, you know, when you see God wills that all are saved, you say, no, he doesn't really will that all be saved. He has no pleasure in death of the wicked. You say, no, that's not really true. He does have pleasure in death of the wicked. And you say, and he wills that uh, all would come to repentance. You say, no, nah, but that's not really true. You better stop saying that's not really true and bow to the scripture and, twi- and, twi- and, and change your doctrine instead of trying to change the scripture. Amen? Now, it's interesting. One uh, Calvinistic professor, acclaimed Calvinistic professor, admits, he goes, yeah, the doctrine of perseverance of saints, once saved, always saved, wasn't taught in the church for 1,500 years. Wow. That's quite an admission. The Westminster Confession which is a confession of the Presbyterian Church, which formed out of Calvinistic divines, so-called, states in section 3, listen to this, the doctrine of once saved, always saved, or what they would call the perseverance of the saints. Sometimes I'll use the term once saved, always saved. Many Calvinists will still use that terminology because if they believe in perseverance of saints, that they will persevere. They still believe in once saved, always saved, don't they? They once you're saved, they'll always be saved. They'll persevere automatically. So I'll sometimes use that term more loosely, the Westminster Confession says this, nevertheless, talking about how true Christians will always be saved no matter what. Nevertheless, believers, it says, may through the temptations of Satan and of the world, the prevalency of corruption remaining in them and the neglect of the means of their uh, preservations fall into grievous sins and for a time continue therein, whereby they incur God's displeasure and grieve the Holy Spirit, come to be deprived of some measure of the graces and comforts have their hearts hardened and their conscience is wounded hurt and scandalize others yeah the Bible teaches all that that can happen but then they add this and bring temporal judgment upon themselves catch that bring what kind of judgments upon themselves temporal so the idea is that they'll have some temporary judgments but they'll never be totally fallen away to the point that they're jettisoned or they're sentenced to hell so the idea is that you'll either always come back or God will use his temporal judgments and so forth you'll always come back and persevere in the end and what have you Uh, it kind of destroys free will huh? free moral agency that we have the freedom to harden our hearts and totally reject God I wrote down 10 reasons and I could have wrote down 30 or 40 honestly you know me I wrote down 10 in just a few minutes because I said I'm going to stop at a round number of some of the concerns that I have regarding the doctrine of once saved, always saved. Number one, it gives many Christians a false sense of security, making them careless in their Christian behavior and doctrine. Number two, it causes serious confusion concerning the genuine biblical teaching of assurance of salvation, which is clearly taught in 1 John, that it's those who abide in the Lord, who continue to trust the Lord that they may know that they have eternal life. Amen. First John is the strongest book that talks about testing your faith and making sure you're in the faith. Amen. Number three, it causes Christians to ignore the powerful warnings, the warning passages that would otherwise help them persevere in grace. Number four, it causes them to see grace as a license to sin. 
without impunity or with impunity it causes christians to fail to fear god the way jesus instructed the apostles to in matthew chapter 10 where he told his own elect apostles not to fear man who can destroy the body but fear god who can destroy your body and soul in hell number six it causes profound confusion regarding the role of free will in the christian life number six it removes a key element of omitting, of, of of motivating believers to live holy lives because author hebrews states without holiness in hebrews 12 15 no one will see the lord and in that context he warns see to that none of you fail the grace of god it causes believers number eight to believe they don't need to put on the armor of god and fight the good fight against the evil one to have inevitable victory in the end number nine it keeps christians from recognizing clear signs of apostasy in their lives because apostasy is apostasy is considered impossible However, the Apostle Paul says, let him who thinks he stand, 1 Corinthians 10, 12, take heed lest he fall. Amen. 10, number 10, it has contributed greatly to many other false doctrines and much wicked behavior in the church that causes the world to see the church as hypocrites. I remember Bill Clinton, Newsweek doing a whole thing on him and his, and his loose lifestyle and said, and they said, but he grew up a Baptist and he believed in the doctrine of once saved, always saved. I, I go through that, I quote that, I show, I document that in a video I did called The Great Deception, which I'm, be, I'm in the process of redoing right now as we talk, updating. Brother Robert Severn begged me more than once before he died, can you please update that video? Because he saw the impact it had on many people. So there's many more concerns in that. I believe personally that the doctrine once saved, always saved has damned more souls than all the other false doctrines in the church put together. Because there are millions of people right now where over and over again, Paul in 1 Corinthians 6 and Ephesians chapter 5 and Galatians chapter 5 and 6 were not to be deceived to think that you could live a wicked lifestyle and still inherit the kingdom of God. Yet most Christians that you run into believe they can live a wicked lifestyle and still inherit the kingdom of God. That's the truth. In fact, when people move to other states in our fellowship and they try to find a church, they're like, I get calls, I get people sometimes crying in tears because I can only find churches and people aren't really serious about their walks. And the pastor teaches that once you're saved, you're always saved no matter what you do. And that's the pre- that's a prevalent teaching, by the way. The Calvinistic stress that if you are a genuine believer, you will persevere is less known than the teaching that once you're saved, even if you fall away, you're still saved. But even those who believe that they will persevere to the end if they're one of the elect can still easily be deceived. How? Some of you heard about my wife and I when a dear friend of ours had fallen into Calvinism and we hadn't seen her for some time and, and we ran into her and she was drunk and she was a five-point Calvinist now, she told us, and she was visibly drunk. My wife said, aren't you concerned about your salvation? And she said, hey, either I'm chosen, it doesn't matter, or I'm not chosen and there's no way I can become chosen. That's why we call Calvinism fatalist or the- theistic fatalism. It leads to a fatalistic mentality. You don't really have a choice ultimately in your salvation very 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 destructive brothers and sisters now i want you to go to luke chapter 15 those are some of my introductory comments luke chapter 15 and i want to talk to you for a few moments about the prodigal son the prodigal son do you think the prodigal son is a story about evangelism or do you think it's a story about falling away and regaining your hope. Number two, a lot of people teach it though it's evangelism as though the prodigal son had never been a part, part of his father's family. But there's a few different stages in the story. And the first stage, he is a son, amen? He's alive in his father's house, amen? And Jesus is giving us a picture of being in his house. And they're condemning Jesus the religious leaders, because in chapter 15, verse 1, now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near him to listen to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And he told them this, this parable, saying, he gives them different illustrations about a lost sheep, lost coin, and so forth. But he also tells them about the prodigal son. And they're the older brother in the prodigal son who's upset that the father's going to have grace on sinners or on his other son but it's interesting he starts off a son verse 11 jesus and he jesus said 
a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the uh, share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. So this is not only a son, but he has an inheritance, amen, from his father. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. He goes away into a distant or far country. And there he what? Squandered his estate with loose living. His brother would later describe that loose living as being a life of filth. You know, and uh, it's quite heartbreaking uh, because he got into who knows what depths of depravity. Doesn't, Jesus doesn't give a whole lot of explanation, but loose living, you know, that could mean women, that could mean drunkenness, that could mean theft, that could mean all kinds of different things. But he squandered his state on loose living. He wasted all his money on loose living. Don't waste your money on loose living. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. It's Jesus emphasizing the point of depravity he got because Jews regarded swine as being what? Unclean. Now he's serving like the lowest creature in the Jewish mind. And he, and he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving anything to him. He was so hungry, he wished he could eat what these pigs were eating, but he couldn't even couldn't even eat these things because they were keeping track of the food but when he came to his senses that is he repented the word repent is metanoia it means to have a change of mind amen a change of heart change of the will that leads to a change of direction but when he came to his senses he said how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread but i am dying here with hunger He's talking about the hired men servants he wants to just hope, hopefully just come back and become a servant. Not a son. He's, he departed from his father. He squandered his wealth on loose living. He's starving to death. He knows his father's a good man. And that the other slaves, the other servants are better fed than he is. Verse 18, I will get up and go to my father. That's what true uh, repentance does. It leads to a change of heart, change of mind, and a change of will and a change of direction. I will get up and go on my, to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. That's the father heart. Jesus said, if you see me, you've seen the father. Amen. Amen. Jesus, God, the, the God man, amen. God in the flesh came to earth to rescue us, amen. He ran pretty far, didn't he? And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But quickly the father said to his slaves, quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet not wring his neck and put cement around his, wet cement on his feet and throw him in the ocean, but and bring the fatted calf, kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. Let's have a party. For this son of mine was what? Dead. And has come to life what? Again. You might want to circle the word again because you're going to see that word a lot in this study. He came to life a what? Again. He was lost and has been what? Found. And they began to what? to celebrate amen so isn't it interesting was he alive before he was lost in his father's house was he a son alive in his father's house yes or no absolutely does that would that signify physically alive or spiritually alive for the sake of a spiritual lesson that jesus is teaching here spiritual life now when he died did he die physically or spiritually spiritually Amen. Now he's alive again, which indicates what? That he was alive one other time, amen, before, and that in between being alive again and, and being alive in the past, there was intervening time where he was what? Dead. In fact, the father says as much. My son was lost, but now he's found. He was dead. 
but now he's alive. In fact, if you go to the, near the end of the parable, he says the same thing. Verse 32, that when the son is like rebuking his dad for blessing his son from coming back. Verse 32, he says, but we had to celebrate and, and rejoice for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been what? Found. Now, I think it's interesting because when we fall away from the Lord, if you choose to do so, doesn't mean that uh, Calvinists would say, well, that person was never spiritually alive. They were never really born again. Or they would say they're born again and they're just going to lose their rewards. But they're still born again. See, those Calvinists who believe that you will persevere to the end will say they probably were never born again in the first place if you fall away. Or don't worry, if they were really born again, they'll come back. Or the other Calvinists who stress the idea of once saved, always saved, and describe it as once saved, always saved, will say, as I mentioned, well, they're still born again. They still love. Deep down, they still know Jesus. They're just going to lose their rewards or lose their crowns. But they're still born again. Both of those lies are refuted and dealt a death blow with the scripture. Because we see that while he was alive, he ceased to be what? Alive. And he entered into spiritual death. Amen? It destroys the idea that if you're truly born again, you won't fall away. It destroys the idea that if you fall away, you're still spiritually alive as well. I think this is very, very interesting. Now, the Greek word translated alive again, it's one Greek word. The Greek word is anazao. Anazao. It literally means to come to life again, revive, regain life, to recover life, the Greek word. In fact, it's a verb, it's a very interesting verb, and the zao part, anazao, the zao part, the suffix of the word anazao, literally means to come to life. Zao. The Greek prefix, ana, carries the force of again. This is why the word translated, is translated alive again. And Jesus uses it of the prodigal son, having died spiritually and coming to life all over again. Okay? There's three points here that I think are important. Number one, it would have been impossible for him to come to life again if he had not been alive in the past at an earlier time, which he clearly was. Secondly, he could not have come alive again unless he were spiritually dead in the intervening time between when he was first alive the first time and made alive again. Okay? Number three, okay, well, before I get to number three, well, I'll just state number three. It's an important fact of Scripture. The Scriptures clearly teach that if one does fall away, one can what? One can be restored what? Again. Because some teach if you fall away, you can never come back to Jesus. That's a false teaching. So, there's a lot there. And believe me, I'd love to spend a whole service in the prodigal son, just getting into, into it, but I'll go through five different passages and look at more of the forest than one single tree tonight. As, as wonderful and powerful as that passage is. But Jesus clearly teaches that you can be spiritually alive, abandon your father, and your soul is in jeopardy and you're spiritually dead at a certain point. And that you need to restore to your father, be restored to your father to come back life again. And you don't sit around waiting for yourself to irresistibly be drawn to the father. You must freely choose. This son freely chose to leave his father's house, didn't he? He had to freely choose to go back. And he came to his senses and he came back. That doesn't mean that God's grace wasn't drawing him or working on him. But he certainly was. I have, I have no doubt. Uh, it doesn't state that in the parable, but when you go throughout Scripture, yes, God continues to knock. Don't harden your hearts. If anyone hears my voice, he's talking to the church there. Let Laodicea there. Let him hear. If anyone hears my voice, let him open up. Amen? So I do believe he chases us down. But he had the choice. He had to make the choice. He came to his senses and he went back. Amen? So very, very important. The next passage I want to look at is Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. And this is another very, very, one of the strongest warnings that refutes 
the doctrine of once saved, always saved. Romans 11, Paul is talking about the olive tree, the salvation tree, a picture of, of, of those who are in the tree are saved, those who are not in the tree are not saved. Those who are in the tree get, get broken off, are broken off from the salvation tree, broken off from salvation, so to speak. Those who are grafted in receive salvation. And we read in Romans chapter 11, verse 20. And I wish I had time to go into more of the uh, context here. But, well, in verse 19, he warns the Gentile believers not to be arrogant against the Jewish believers that were broken off. Not to say, oh yeah, we're the chosen people now. God chose us instead of you. And, and, and we're, we're the special elect of God now. And we're it, you know. And, you know, we can't be lost. But you guys are. Yeah, he's warning against that kind of arrogance. Which is not only among many, many Calvinists who believe that they've replaced Israel in teaching replacement theology, that God's done with Israel. And that they're inevitably chosen no matter what, irresistibly, and can't be lost. Paul is warning against both those false doctrines. God's not done with Israel. And he says to those who become arrogant in their faith, verse 19, you will say branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right. They were broken off for their unbelief. But you stand by your what? You don't stand by irresistible grace. You don't stand because you have no choice in your salvation. You stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but what? But fear. Do you know you're supposed to have a healthy, godly fear regarding your salvation? Don't be conceited. Like once I'm saved, I'm always saved. <laughs> but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, the Jews, he will not what? Spare you either. Who are you to think that you're special, some kind of a special elect person that can't be lost? If he didn't spare the natural branches, he won't spare you either. Peter makes a similar argument. He goes, if he didn't spare the angels, right, who are created higher than us, then he warns that we need to make sure we're serious about following the Lord in 2 Peter. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Behold, then the kindness and severity of God to those who fell, severity, but to you, God's kindness, if you continue in his kindness, otherwise you also will be what? You will be cut off. Wow. Who's he talking to, believers or non-believers here? Christians or non-Christians? Or is he talking to a mixed group of Christians and some people that aren't really in the tree? No, he's directing it specifically to those who are in the tree who stand by their faith, amen? And tells them that they simply need to continue. You don't tell a non-believer, a professing Christian who's not saved to continue in his state. That would just damn his soul, amen? You tell believers to continue in the faith. If, you might circle the word if in the middle of verse 22, if you continue in his kindness, putting trust in God's grace, Otherwise, you also will be what? Cut off. Oh, here comes that word again. A different Greek word. Not anazao, but another Greek word. Verse 23. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be what? Grafted in. For God is able to graft them in what? Again. You might want to circle that word again again. That, that word is pollen. P-A-L-I-N. That's the normal Greek word, if I can use that term, that terminology in the New Testament that's typically translated again. But notice it says that it can be grafted in what? Again, if they don't continue their unbelief. If they don't continue their unbelief, they'll come to what? Saving faith, amen? And they'll be grafted in where? Again, right? Showing that they had been grafted in where? Before, Before amen? So if they're brought back to salvation in the salvation tree, again, it shows you that they were once in the tree before, Paul and amen, in the intervening time, they were broke, broken off and needed to be grafted back in again. So there was a time where they were saved, amen? And they were trusting in Yahweh, many of them. And they were broken off of the covenant tree. But they could be grafted in again. By the way, this is beautiful truth regarding someone who's broken off. There's hope because they can be grafted in where? Again. A second time. Amen. The Greek word pollen means anew. Back. Once more. Jews are able to be grafted in again. So clear. You stand by your faith. Amen. Continue to trust Jesus. 
continue to not be conceited but fear to consider the goodness and the severity of God amen you need to apply this to your life and say you know what I want to determine each and every day to keep looking to Jesus amen to keep trusting him to understand that I am to actually fear concerning what he says here don't be conceited but fear regarding my standing in the Lord a healthy fear a fear not like oh no no praise you Lord Jesus I'm saved but guess what the temptations come depart from the faith do your own thing fear apostasy fear forsaking the living God amen go to the book of Galatians Galatians chapter 4 now Galatians 1 Paul says I'm amazed that you're so quickly being removed from the uh, grace of Christ to another gospel for the one who's called you to the grace of Christ to another gospel he says if we are an angel from heaven preach another gospel to you than that which we preach you let him be what accursed so he's concerned he's amazed that some of the Galatians are quickly being removed he says from the grace of the gospel they're falling away in chapter 3 he says who bewitched you he started well you know you started the spirit but now you're trying to be perfected by the flesh they were going back to what what was this other gospel that Paul was concerned about with regard to the Galatians remember the law of Moses amen we're not under the law of Moses we're guided by the law of Christ amen and the law of Christ doesn't even save us amen it's the blood of Christ that Jesus shed on the cross in his resurrection that saves us, amen? Faith in him, amen? But his law, his, the law of Christ that says, we're told at least twice in the New Testament that we're not under the law of Moses. We're told way more than twice that we're not under the law of Moses. But we're told twice that we're under the law of Christ as our guide. But they were being told they had to be circumcised, that they had to keep the Sabbaths, that they keep the, the feast days, things of that nature. And that was a huge concern. And then we read in Galatians chapter 4, verse 8. However, at that time, when you did not know God, you were, you were what? Slaves to that, uh, you were slaves to those which by nature are no gods. There's only one true God by nature. They were slaves before they became Christians. But now you have come to know God, now that you've come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how is it that you turn back again to the weak and worthless elemental things to which you desire to be enslaved all over what? Again. And by the way, pollen is there used twice. But now that you have come to know God or rather to be known by God, how is it that you turn back again, pollen, to the weak and worthless elemental things to which you desire to be enslaved all over again, pollen again? Palin. Verse 10, you observe days and months and seasons and years. They're going back to the Jewish, not just the Jewish knife, circumcision, but to the Jewish calendar. Wow. Verse 11, I fear for you that perhaps I have labored over you in vain. In other words, I've labored over you to no effect because you're going back to enslavement all over again. Chapter 5. Verse 1. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm. It's a present tense imperative. Therefore, keep on standing firm. And do not be subject again to what? Do not be subject what? Again. To the yoke of slavery. Don't let anybody tell you that you can't fall away and end up in the state you were before. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision... I mean, you go back to the law of Moses, you're circumcised because you want to follow the law of Moses, and you don't believe your salvation is complete through faith in Christ. Christ will be of what? Does it say of some benefit or little benefit? It says of no benefit to you. Verse 3, and I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep what? The whole law. If you want to go that way, the way of the uh, Hebrew Roots movement, to say, oh, we got to keep these Old Testament laws to be saved, then you have to keep the whole enchilada. Curses everyone who doesn't continue in all of the law, Paul says earlier in Galatians 3. Well, look at verse 4. Verse 4 is so clear. You have been what? Severed from Christ. Severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law. Those of them who are trying to get right with God through the law, law of Moses are falling into a different gospel. And guess what it says here? You have been severed from Christ. And you have what? 
you have fallen. You have fallen from grace. You cannot be severed from that which you were not in union with. Amen? And you cannot fall from a place that you haven't been in grace. To fall from grace means to have once been in grace and to fall. And guess what? They are returning again three times now. We read that in verse 9 of 4. And in chapter 5, verse 1, subject again to a yoke of slavery. And Paul says, he fears that he may have labored over them in vain. Go back now to chapter 4, verse 19, which we haven't looked at yet. My children with whom I am again, what? In labor until what? In labor who I am again. There's Palin again, by the way. I'm again in labor until Christ is formed in you. He doesn't want to labor over there in vain. He wants them to belong to Jesus. He wants to be filled with Jesus, amen? And not go back to the law of Moses where they'll fall from grace and be cut off or severed from Christ. I don't know how it could be made any clearer. I don't know how you can write clear warnings about falling away in apostasy. Are you seeing the word again, again and again, being about going back to our former state or returning back to our salvific state? Go to Hebrews chapter 6. Praise God. We're making all right time as I look at the clock because I, I did this message and it ended up being 14, 15 pages. It was 15 pages. I changed the font, made myself feel better. It went to 14 pages. Typed. Actually wanted to use another font, but I thought, oh, that's cool. It's 14 now. <laughs> Galatians, we went through. Now look at Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews 6. And this is a passage that we could spend weeks on. We'll spend minutes on, unfortunately. But I, like I said, I didn't want to do a five-part series on this. Hebrews chapter 6. Now let me say this. Hebrews chapter 6 is the strongest book that warns against once saved, always saved in all the Bible. Every other chapter or so gives strong warnings against the idea that you're saved unconditionally forever and ever or that you don't have to persevere or that you will inevitably persevere. It's such a strong book of warnings, certain Christians wish it wasn't even in the Bible and have tried to wish it was out of the Bible, you know, in the past. Uh, some say, well, the warnings are just hypothetical. God's just bluffing to keep people in the faith. God's not malicious, guys. He doesn't bluff and make cruel threats. He gives sincere warnings. He doesn't say stay out of the street because you really can't get hit by the car. He says stay in Christ because you really can get hit by the enemy. And when you get to the warning in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 8, many Christians, if you were to take a poll on what's the strongest warning against falling away in the Bible, most people would say Hebrews chapter 6. I would say Hebrews chapter 10 and then 6. And some days I would say Hebrews 6 and then 10. They're both super strong and very close in their warnings. But some would say, oh, well, he's not really warning believers in Hebrews chapter 6. He's not warning believers because it's this hypothetical you really can't fall away. And the description he gives of these people must fall short of salvation. Although one Calvinist says, no, he says, it's hard, we'd be hard to find a clearer definition of what a Christian is than right there. He admitted that. He just says the people that fall away, they're still saved in the end, even though they turn against Christ as a false Messiah. That's a lie too. First of all, let me make it clear that Hebrews is warning baby Christians at this point that ought to be mature. And if you go to Hebrews 5, right before there's no chapter breaks, and you read the last few verses of chapter 5, you'll see that he's treating them as babes in Christ in the last few verses there uh, who ought to be teaching others and ought to be on meat, but they're still babes. They're still on milk. And they need to get beyond the elementary teachings of Christ and press forward because they can't discern good and evil. They're in danger of falling away. That's why he gives them such a warning here. In fact, I think it's quite interesting that Calvinists who try to wiggle out of this passage by saying it's not really addressed to Christians, the most famous Calvinist who ever lived, John, uh, well, you can't really call John Calvin a Calvinist, but uh, Charles Spurgeon, uh, he actually chided his fellow Calvinists for not admitting that this is warning to genuine Christians. If you read Dr. Gill, Spurgeon writes, Dr. Owen and almost all the eminent Calvinistic writers 
They all of them assert that these persons are not Christians. They say that enough is said here to represent a man who is Christian externally, but not enough to give the portrait of a true believer. Now listen to what Spurgeon says to that. Now it strikes me that that, that it strikes me, he says, that they would not have said this if they had not some doctrine to uphold. Amen to that. For a child reading this passage would say that the persons intended by it must be Christians. Amen to that. If the Holy Spirit intended to describe Christians, I do not see that he could have used more explicit terms than there are here, much like the other Calvinists I quoted. How can a man be said to be enlightened, to taste the heavenly gift, to be made a partaker of the Holy Ghost? without being a child of God. I humbly conceive that they allowed their judgments to be a little warped when they said that. And I think that I shall be able to show that none but true believers are here described. Now, he admits it's a warning to true believers, but then he points out that it says if they fall away. If is hypothetical, they won't fall away, i.e. Calvinism. The only problem with that is in verse 4, it doesn't say if they fall away. Verses 4 through 6. There's no if in the Greek. There's an if in the King James Bible. But it's not in the Greek. And Spurgeon didn't know Greek. The Greek word is, translates five words as peripossantos. Having, or having uh, fallen away. That translates a few words. Actually, I should, I gotta go back and count. I'm going from my memory here. Verse 4. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened... By the way, these terms are used, many of these terms are used, of full transaction, not like, you know, oh, the person nibbled something, or they just got a little bit of this or that, of true salvation experiences in the Scripture and sometimes in Hebrew, the book of Hebrews itself. For the case of those who have once been enlightened, in Hebrews chapter 10, the same Greek word that's translated enlightened here and is translated enlightened in Hebrews chapter 10, the author of Hebrews talks about those who endured all kinds of persecution, some of them even losing their homes, but they rejoiced. You know why? Because this is after they were enlightened. They received these persecutions, but they rejoice because they have a home in heaven. It's used of believers, amen? And have tasted of the heavenly gift. Who's the heavenly gift? Who's the heavenly gift? Jesus. They've tasted of the Lord Jesus Christ and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit. By the way, all these are in the, what's called the aorist tense in the Greek. They were enlightened in the past. They tasted of Jesus, the heavenly gift, in the past. They experienced him in the past and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit. By that way, that Greek word partakers, it's used in Hebrews 3.1 and Hebrews 3.14 of holy brethren who are partakers of the heavenly calling. It's used of Jesus in Hebrews chapter 2, who, Matekos, who was a partaker. He partook of flesh and blood. Do I believe that he didn't really partake of flesh and blood? Like the Gnostics? that it was just like an apparition or he just seemed to be flesh? Wrong. He was a true partaker. That word partaker, and I say this because Calvinists try to diminish the meaning of all these words, it, just like Spurgeon said, to protect their false doctrine. Although he didn't call it a false doctrine. He just didn't like the way they're going about it by twisting scripture. By the way, they become partakers of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in John 14, 17, that the world cannot receive the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that the world can't even receive the things of the Spirit. That these people have the Holy Spirit in them at one time. And have tasted the good word of God. Amen? And he, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, it talks about tasting the word of God. Amen? It talks about how they taste the word of God and they were saved, you know. And have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. They've been tasting the powers of the age to come. Like those in Hebrews chapter 11, they have a foretaste of their inheritance in the city above, not made with hands. They've already experienced a spiritual resurrection because they have the, Holy Spirit, have the Holy Spirit living in them and they're anticipating the full-blown physical resurrection at the coming of Jesus. Amen? Amen? And have what? And then have what? Verse six. And then have fallen away. By the way, and then have fallen away. There's those five words. It doesn't say if they fall away and then have fallen away. Peripasantas is one Greek word in the aorist tense. They did fall away. So Spurgeon's right as far as these guys are wrong, trying to say these guys were never saved, but Spurgeon's wrong in saying if, in, indicates it's hypothetical that they won't fall away. If, meaning it's not saying they did fall away. Wrong. Spurgeon didn't know Greek. He didn't know there wasn't an if in the Greek. 
It speaks of those who had fallen away. It actually happened. So much for the hypothetical view that you can't truly fall away. This gives an account of some who did. Amen? Amen. And then have fallen away. It's impossible to renew them what? Again. You might want to circle that word again, again. There it is again. Palin, again to repentance. Since they crucified themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to open shame. What does it mean to crucify the Son of God afresh? They're crucifying him. Paul said, I'm crucified to the world. The world's crucified to me. Meaning dead to me. Jesus becomes dead to them. That means, again, he becomes dead. That's because they were once spiritually alive. Amen? It's impossible to renew them again to repentance. Meaning they had what before? Repented before. Amen? You can't say, oh, they never really came to repentance in the past. Oh, they were just pretend Christians. They were just superficial Christians. No, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance. Meaning the repentance that they need to be saved they had before. It's impossible to renew them again to that state. Are you with me? There the word again is again. For the ground that drinks the rain, which often falls on it, while they crucify themselves, the Son of God afresh and put him to open shame. And it goes on, because I'm not going to get to Peter if I don't go right now, but I'm just going to say this. It talks about severe judgment in verses 7 and 8, being burned, being near cursed, and then end up being burned in the end. Not their works, not their, their rewards being burned, but them, they themselves being burned. Like John 15, 6, Jesus said, if a man doesn't remain in me to his own elect, 11 apostles, Judas had already left, he'll be cut off, he thrown in the fire, and be what? Burned. Brothers and sisters, this is so clear. This is so clear. Now, it's also important that you understand this. You say, well, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance. Why? It's impossible, if they fall away, to impossible to renew them again to repentance. Since they again crucify to themselves, the word since, sometimes translated because, is a present participle. A present tense participle. It's better translated uh, uh, while, or as they do, or as they. Meaning, it's impossible to renew them again repentance while they are crucifying Christ afresh. Not that they can't get right with God. In fact, it's interesting. Uh, the Greek uh, present tense participles there are quite important. And Paul warns, well, let me quote for you the participle from the International Standard Version. Translates it that it's impossible to do those repentance who, quote, who have fallen away as long as, the present tense participle, not since, not because, because this isn't a good translation, as long as they continue to crucify the Son of God afresh to their own detriment by exposing him to public ridicule. So yeah, if, so did we learn in the prodigal son that you can come back, yes or no? Yes. Did we learn in Romans 11 that you could be brought back and grafted back in the vine, yes or no? Yes. Is Hebrews chapter 6 contradicting that? Absolutely not. Because they can come back too, but not as long as they are crucifying them afresh. If someone has hatred toward Jesus, they want nothing to do with him, it's impossible to do them back to repentance in a present tense state while they're in that state. doesn't mean their heart can't be softened because many a lost person who rejected, who turned away from Jesus has been softened again and come back to him like the prodigal son and like the Jews who he said would be able to be grafted back in again. Now please go to 2 Peter. 2 Peter. Now I got 824 on this clock and 829 on that clock. Which one is correct? 29. Man, why couldn't it be 24? Okay, Lord, work this out to your glory. Okay, in 2 Peter chapter 2, briefly, these clocks are always, always synced. They just, one of them just got off. In 2 Peter chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 2, the first three verses, he describes Christians as those who have, who have escaped the corruptions of this world. Catch that? That's how the first few verses go. See, a lot more than that. Then he warns that they need to grow in their faith and add to their faith various virtues, and that if they don't, they can become short-sighted and blind. You remember, we studied this passage a while back. And they can forget that they were what? Cleansed from their past sins. It doesn't say forget that you were once going to church. He says forget that they were saved. Forget that they were cleansed from their past sins. And then in chapter 2, he goes on to warn them about angels who fell away. Okay? He goes to warn them about those who forsook the straight way. And then he warns them that there's false prophets that are seeking to deceive them in chapter 2, verse 18. For speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they entice by fleshly desires, by sensuality, those who barely escape from the ones who live in error, promising them freedom while they themselves are what? Slaves of corruption. For while a man is overcome by this, he will be enslaved. Look at this. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world, who does it apply to? 
anyone who falls away after having been set free. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world, that's how he describes believers in chapter one, the first three verses. By the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The word knowledge there is epinosis. That's why the NIV, if you have that, is, or the Living Bible, both translate it knowing, after knowing Jesus, after coming to know him as experiential knowledge. Even John MacArthur, who's a Calvinist in his commentary in 2 Peter, says that epinosis refers to saving a knowledge earlier in the book. And after, after epinosis of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, knowing Jesus, they are what? They are what? They are what? Again. again. Palin again. Circle that word again. Again. They are again entangled in them and are overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first, for it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment entangled or hand it down to them. It's happened to them, according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit, and a sow, after washing, returns to wallowing in the mire. And the Calvinists might say, well, if the sow was really born again, it wouldn't want to go back to the mud. That's not the imagery he's using there. He's using the imagery in chapter one, after having been washed from your sins, you forget that you were ever washed from your sins. That's what he's talking about. You can be like the pig who goes back to the wall of the mire because you forget. That's chapter one. Forget that they were cleansed. Brothers and sisters, I want to say so much more on these texts, but I sped through it because I wanted to cover a lot of ground. And in chapter three, verse 17, it ends this way. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you do not be, you're not carried away by the error of lawless and fall from your what? Your own secure position. I'm quoting the NIV here because I think it's a great translation there. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, prognosco, foreknowledge there, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of what? Of the lawless and what? Fall from your own what? secure position. You can fall from your secure position and once again be entangled and overcome. And the word entangled and overcome have to do with being in a hopeless situation like a fish in a net back in the world. Don't go back to the world. Don't entertain Satan's temptations, whether it's alcohol, whether it's drugs, whether it's lust, whether it's cheating or unfaithfulness, whatever it is that Satan might try to dangle before you whether it's just being lazy and not pursuing Jesus. Don't commit spiritual suicide and deliberately fall away from the Lord. Amen? Don't die by spiritual starvation where you no longer feed on Jesus and his word through faith. Amen? A slow death. Keep your faith in Jesus. Amen? Stand fast in Jesus. Amen? Remember your life is like a vapor. It's here and then it's gone. Your, your, your life's going to be quick. Amen? Our lives are vapors. Many, these last several years, they've gone so fast. The next will go even faster. Why would you blow eternity on a few useless meals of sin? Amen? Jesus loves you. And you know what? Don't fall into false teaching that will lead you away from Jesus. As Paul said, watch your doctrine. First, or first, Pete, first Timothy 4, 16. Watch your doctrine and your behavior. And in so doing, you'll save yourself and those who hear you. Save yourself. You don't save yourself. But as you abide in Christ, guess what? You allow him to save you. Amen? And in that way, you cast yourself on his salvation. Amen? Continue to keep your faith in Jesus and his shed blood. It's not by works. It's not by anything we can do to earn salvation. Amen? We're saved by grace through faith. Not of ourselves, a gift of God. Not of works that anyone should boast. But guess what? Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 5, you are kept by the power of God through faith. You must have faith and trust him and continue in faith. Jesus said, he that endures the end will be what? Will be saved, amen. Let's continue to trust Jesus to the end. There's five death blows to once saved, always saved. And I, every one of those death blows has a bunch of, all together there's a bunch of agains there showing that you can return to your former state and again be entangled and overcome. But showing that you can repent and guess what? Again, be grafted in. And become, if you become dead spiritually, you can be